what's really unique about your experience is that you've really seen venture from like the entire journey perspective from starting at a very early intro stage all the way to obviously now being a partner and in leading investments and sitting on boards. And I think that's a perspective that oftentimes people don't get to see this whole thing because either they leave halfway in the middle or they come halfway in the middle. So I think yeah. it's really unique that you have that perspective. And you've also seen the entire blockchain crypto space really from its very nascent days. So maybe transitioning a little bit from your VC days into talking a little bit about your journey in blockchain and crypto as well. Obviously things looked very different when uh, we were just talking about blockchain stuff like way back in 2015, all the way to now, especially given how quickly the markets are. So maybe you could walk all of us through a little bit about the surprising or maybe not surprising changes you've seen over the years. Yeah, it's been it's been such a roller coaster. I mean, when I joined in 2015, it, it was it was a cool experience in that like the first thing that I did was I went to a crypto conference and I, I kid you not, there were like the geekiest guys there, like computer scientists. There were just you know random speculators, guys in cowboy hats, to some guys in business suits that look really scammy. And then you have maybe a few guys that were, you know, serial entrepreneurs or guys that, you know, had had done some stuff in the startup space, but that was just a really, really small fraction of things. And so, you know, the diversity in the space and um, the the imbalance in the space was just was just crazy. And so those were the crypto conferences. There was just a lot of like uh, noise out there and they weren't that there wasn't that much that much attention on them too. So there's maybe one crypto conference like a month or something, or maybe even like a decent sized conference like once a quarter for the first like few quarters. Um, you know, the, the press was very poor, it's very negative. It was it was really lonely. <laughs> I'd have to say it's really lonely. And 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 you know it's it's nice to be able to talk about what you do to other people. And, you know, it's always obviously nice that they understood it, but, you know, even the first part is just respecting it, right? And so I remember like coming into this space and some of my friends are like, Bitcoin is such a scam. Like that's such a, that's such a harsh word. I was like, oh man, so now I'm in like a scammy industry and, you know, it's like, what are you doing, right? You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of promise here. It's like, and, I, and it's one of the myths that we talked about during our, uh, during our sessions today. Bitcoin is just used for drug dealing and Silk Road and all of that. So I think there was just a lot of negativity for the first year or so. And in terms of companies, I mean, a lot of them were just one person, computer scientists that really didn't think about how a technology would, would get to market and what is sort of needed for a technology to sort of develop. So we're seeing a lot of a, a lot of solo founders, a lot of imbalanced teams, things that just weren't really investable. But, you know, one of the first theses that we had in the space, me and Dan, we sat down and he's like, hey, you know, you just got here. The first thing that we have to do is into every single company like Coinbase all around the world, um, you know, because we were already in a company called Bitstamp that was competitive with Coinbase. So, uh, you know, except Bitstamp wasn't focused on, uh, you know, brokerage, it was just focused on the exchange, but it was already competitive. But basically, he wanted me to go out there and find local on ramps in all the geographies that matter for cryptocurrency. So, you know, the first investment that I did was in the Coinbase of Korea. And, you know, with Korea, huge gaming population, they're all huge gamblers, which is great for cryptocurrency. They have capital controls, which is you know helpful for crypto because you know people do use crypto to move money across borders, and you know they had a huge mobile population, and so that's an example of being in early, following the thesis, and you know it ended up selling for you know twelve x in a very short period of time, and so we kind of went out there and executed that thesis even all the way up until today we still execute that thesis. So, you know, with, with what's gone on in our space, it's really nice to have theses from uh, time to time that you just are so bullish on, you go out there, you find the companies who are in the top 
brokerage in Latin America, and they are just about to raise a monster round led by one of the you know best well-known growth companies out there. And so that thesis still plays out. But as we move from 2014, where there weren't too many companies, 2015, we started seeing you know, I'd say enterprise companies start talking about cryptocurrency. We had the R3 project, which was a consortium of some of the largest banks, JP Morgan, et cetera, you know, getting into cryptocurrency or getting into blockchain. Remember, then it was like trying to remove the word Bitcoin, remove the word cryptocurrency. Everything was all about the underlying technology, but it was all about like, you know, more centralized idea around these consortiums of using the blockchain almost as a, a database as a service and you know that was kind of the uh you know heading toward kind of like a more like bear market for the industry because a lot of enterprises were wanting to use blockchain 2015 we actually saw uh, a lot of serial entrepreneurs coming into space but a lot of the applications that they were going for consumer applications because it was just bitcoin and people were just not educated enough about bitcoin none of those consumer applications like really worked and none of the developer tooling really worked so then we headed into 2016 where it was all enterprise and that's kind of when i was you know you know when we when we talked in 2015 i was already starting to kind of wonder where the space is going 2016 i actually almost left the space i was thinking okay this isn't going anywhere. Every VC that I was talking to was saying, okay, if you, if you have a blockchain company, I don't want to see it. You know, it was, it was pretty depressing. And so I actually started to wonder whether this was going to be the right industry for me. And as I was just like halfway, like starting to look around, I met an entrepreneur or I guess now a fund manager. His name is Olaf Carlson Wee of Polychain. And I had conversations with him and he was telling me about Ethereum, which I was already like starting to get intrigued by, you know, we, we've looked at Ethereum. We didn't do too much with Ethereum. That was probably the biggest miss of Pantera was not investing into Ethereum in the crowd sale early enough, but he was telling me about this multi-token world and about all the different use cases, especially around DeFi that early on. And you know, we bet on we bet on Olaf. We invest into a GP round of Polychain, and from there, in late 2016, early 2017, Ethereum started to enable community-owned projects uh, and decentralized applications. And from then, I mean, it's just been quite the journey because we kind of went through, and we can always get into more detail, but we went through kind of the bubble of 2017. It burst, and you know, I think. Part of the reason why it burst was because there's just so much money made and so much so much scams out there, and a lot of retail investors really just got burned. But the best thing about these bull markets that happen is it does educate a lot of people, whether you do get burned or not, and you get awesome talent that comes in, and you get the problems uh, that that emerge that need to get solved. And from 2017, we really, we really saw that scalability needed to get solved. And obviously regulations needs to get solved and, and that sort of thing. And so uh, 2018 and 2019, it was all about building. We know the problems that need to be solved. Let's build. <clears throat> the great thing is it's a bear market. So we don't have employees leaving and starting their own funds or you know, living in Costa Rica because they've made so much money. Now everybody's just focused on building their business. And then you know, late 2019, early 2020, we're starting to see progress with scalability. And, you know, DeFi starts taking off. DeFi starts taking off for, I think, two reasons. A global pandemic where, you know, people are, are, are you know, moving money to things that might have, have value and might have asymmetric opportunities, and that's Bitcoin. I think something else that also helped was basically um, decentralized exchanges starting to emerge and have the right user experience to actually get people onboarded and trading. And I think the biggest, the biggest block to innovation, I think, in 18 and 19 was the fact that people did get scared from regulation. And therefore, none of the projects that were launching could ever actually decentralize. 
no one could actually issue a token that can get into the hands of users. And if that doesn't happen, the space is not going anywhere. So by being able to have decentralized exchanges that allow you to have tokens in the hands of users, and of course has spawned a bunch of liquidity mining, that's what really just started, you know, DeFi and these projects being able to actually launch, get out there, get traction. And that's kind of where we are today. On any kind of yeah. websites or resources that you would recommend us to share with students and alumni. So they have something that they can click through and play around with. I, I think I think the I, I think the steps to get started in crypto for me are, you know, I think Bitcoin, usually people just ask about Bitcoin and, you know, they, they want to place to store their wealth where there is significant upside. And so we recommend anywhere from one to 10%, but I'd say for, for, for folks, I mean, you know, even just like you're a lower single digit percentage of your net worth in Bitcoin is just a, a great way to get started because an amount where if it just evaporates, you won't be in a dire situation. But, you know, enough where if something happens, then, you know, you could be in a very great situation. So that's why a single digit net percentage uh, of your net worth, you know, makes a lot of sense in Bitcoin. And then beyond that, then you could then buy, you know, something like Ethereum. And, uh, you know, once you have Bitcoin and Ethereum, then, you know, I think the next thing that people do that, that I've been recommending and that, you know, I've, I've, I've seen work is, well, you know, especially during an environment right now where you just can't get yield anywhere. You know, I remember during the pandemic, I mean, I had a lot of my net worth in just USD and my bank accounts would say, hey, our interest rates are dropping to 25 basis points, 0.25%. And now we have stable coins that are backed by US dollar one to one where you could be generating up to 8.6 or even 10 to 12% by basically lending out your, uh, your stable coin. And so you can get yield with Bitcoin, you get yield with Ethereum, and there are other consumer applications out there that are basically taking away the complexity of needing to, you know, do other things that you can be doing to get yield on cryptocurrency by just providing sort of a, you know, uh, a yield consumer app. So I think those are some of the easiest ways to get in. Once you go beyond that, then I would say, you know, what you could do is you can, you know, just test out some of those DeFi protocols and you just have to set up a MetaMask account and then, you know, uh, try out something around, uh, I'd say something around lending and borrowing is probably the next uh, big hurdle for people to do. Set up the MetaMask account and go to something like Compound or Aave and actually lend out um, your Bitcoin or Ethereum, but in a non-custodial way. So to recap, first step is Bitcoin, then look into Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies. Then you go into yield farming, then into remaining of deco, uh, DeFi projects and protocols, basically. Yeah, buy Bitcoin, buy Ethereum, lend those out, and then you could then buy something like DPI, which is an index of DeFi tokens. Um, and then of course you could buy some specific DeFi tokens if you want. We're really, big, we're really bullish on decentralized exchanges. Uh, so decentralized exchanges we think are super promising. Um, you know, you have a company like Uniswap that does on a daily basis, sometimes more volume than Coinbase, but the team of 15 people and they can all do that because you don't need the infrastructure to maintain something like Coinbase because it's all running on smart contracts. So something like that has a ton of potential. And then, of course, trying out some of those platforms by going on Uniswap or going on Compound. And then if you really want, you can get into some really interesting food coins <laughs> or something like that. The question of this Bitcoin, great. Ethereum versus indices, because obviously people tend to argue that there's a huge correlation between Bitcoin and Ethereum and a number of the other cryptocurrencies. So to what extent do we think about only the major large cap versus the rest of cryptocurrencies? It's a great question. I mean, the way that we structured our liquid fund is we do have for us about 30 to 40% Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
And then the rest are mid cap and then maybe even some smaller caps that are like, let's just say, we look at the top 100 things that have enough liquidity that we can move around. But as an individual investor, you don't need to. But at the end of the day, I mean, let's just, let's just talk about some of the price targets for Bitcoin and Ethereum this year. Some say Bitcoin may hit 100 to 150,000 dollars. That's a two or three x. Obviously, that's great in the traditional world, right? I mean, two or three x, like you'll you'll take that all the time. For for crypto investors, two or three x, you are a failure if you get two or three x, and so, <laughs> that's that's like great <laughs> solid hedge. Uh, and and Ethereum could be getting to you know, um, I think some could say it could get to maybe. On, on, on highest, like uh, five to 6,000, that would have been a five to six X from where it started earlier this year around a, you know, a thousand or something. That's great too. But if you look at some of these other DeFi protocols that we've invested into in the last like two or three months on the liquid side of things, we're seeing things that are getting double digit sort of multiples within a small time, time period, uh, all the way up to, we have one that's like, 100x in a few months. And so it's one of those things where there's just a lot more upside on cryptocurrencies that are non Bitcoin Ethereum. And so it's nice to have a balance across so that you can hit some of those home runs. It's just like venture capital. You're going to have some home runs, though, in the bull market seems to be like a very high percentage of home runs. Uh, But at the end of the day, Bitcoin Ethereum are still, you know, year over year consistent returns. (laughs) 